All right, let's get it over with. Why do we write? No, seriously, as an aspiring author myself, I often ask myself this very question. Why do we write books? I'm sure there are several reasons too, right? When you have a book like The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. The reason for that book is simple. It's a cautionary tale about the loss of female agency in an incredibly patriarchal society and the resulting powerlessness that women will be forced to feel when that, if that scenario were to come to pass. When you have a book like Patriots by James Wesley Rawls, it's clearly meant to aim at a specific target audience, indulging them with a power fantasy of a day they all think is coming, and carefully assuring them that they are in fact right to act the way they do. When you have a book like Misery, King is writing about his personal experiences as an author, how he felt chained to write specific stories because his fans would reject every time he tried to go outside the box, and how Annie Wilkes it was a great representation to him for his struggle to sober up from the many drugs that he was on, how she was his number one fan who never wanted to leave him, but all she did was torment him. Perhaps you just want to write something fun. There are hundreds of lovely fan works on various websites who might solely exist because an audience member really resonated with the media they just interacted with, and in their own joy and their own love of that media, decided they wanted to add into that world any way they could. I think it all comes down to passion, though. We write because we're passionate about the story we want to tell. It can have a deeper meaning, or it can just be a story we really want to write. But at the heart of it, that passion is the reason we write. So what happens when you write a book with no passion whatsoever? This is Rebels, City of Indra. Welcome everyone to Afrodo Reviews, and on this channel I hope you decide, is that book worth reading over second breakfast, or does it deserve the fiery pits of Mount Doom? So many of you know that when I read my TBR, I briefly forgot that I had purposely ordered Rebels, City of Indra, and thus had, made, had to make a correction later on about it. In hindsight, now that I realize it, this was probably my subconscious trying to save me from 10 days of hair-pulling stupidity. But like a fool, I decided to rush into the book. Rebels, City of Indra was published on June 3rd, 2014. Though the authors are listed as Kylie and Kendall Jenner, the two youngest of the Kardashian clan, I think. It's more accurate to say that the book was written by Maya Sloan, a ghostwriter. I imagine the Kardashians are very much the authors of the book in the same way that Elon Musk is an inventor. I thought I read somewhere that there was two ghostwriters, uh, with Maya Sloan serving as the main writer, whereas there was another one who served as a creative consultant. But after reading that once, I couldn't find it again, so I'm going to assume that was either a fib or it's very, very restricted information. Though, honestly, I can believe that they didn't have one because much of this book feels like their TV show. Uninspired, vapid trash. I think you should experience it. You always say I want to experience things, but I don't think you actually want to experience things because you would experience it if you wanted to experience things. I don't know what you're talking about. With that being said, let's get one thing out of the way. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not even going to sugarcoat this. There is no other possibility for this book. It's awful and it's terrible. <laughs> Which does upset me a little bit. Of the Garbagas lineup that I put out this year, yeah, I guess kind of this year, this was the one book I did have the highest hope to prove me wrong. I wanted to read this and come out and say, wow, this really surprised me. There's no world where I believe that I would have actually loved this book or where I would have thought, you know what, this is a good book, not just in spite of who the authors are. Don't get me wrong, but I figured there was at least a good chance that I could come on here and say, Not bad, kid. Even in my TBR, 
I mentioned that out of all the books I had picked, it probably had one of the more interesting covers. It would be the kind of book where if I didn't recognize the names of the author, I would have probably stopped and read the back because the cover is pretty eye-catching. I mean, look at it. Maybe even pick it up because of the cover. Unfortunately, and with hindsight behind me, I can honestly say that this cover, while pretty and in a vacuum decent, has absolutely nothing to do with the book. And I could pick apart how, I, how whoever drew it clearly never read even a tiny bit of this manuscript. I mean, I mean, look at it. The one major eye in the point. What's that for? Who knows? Eyes aren't a big deal. There's like one brief moment where I actually had to go back and check the book because it didn't establish this very well. But there was one at one point. There's only one point where eyes are even relevant in this book. Then there's also in the eye, if you look real close, it's there's just a woman there, like getting speared through the chest by light. Also not relevant in the slightest. Uh, behind them, you have a sprawling city. That's probably not really relevant because we're talking about a population that's very controlled and unlimited resources, so this kind of gigantic city below them doesn't make sense. In fact, about the only thing about this cover that I think is relevant to this book is this giant tower in the background because that at least serves as an important location and the floating islands behind them because as the cover so creatively said, one of our characters is an heiress, you know, A-I-R-E-S-S, -S, instead of a with an H, which means she's an owner of a f private floating island. Pin in this. But anyway. Now, when I read this book, I made sure to comment on how I had planned to read this book before Daniel Green had really published his video about it. And I did worry that this was going to make me look like I was copying his format. I briefly considered dropping this book, but I I ended up not. I just went through, went ahead with it. I wanted to show you that I have never watched that video because of this very reason. I was going to do my own review, and I didn't want to poison the well. Although I will say that the title of this video, well didn't leave me with a lot of hope that I was going to be proven wrong in putting this in Garb August. But, I gotta be honest, I was not expecting bad of this caliber. Unlike this book, how I open this video is not only relevant to this specific video, but is an important theme of the review. It feels like there's such a lack of passion behind this book that it was physically difficult to read. It doesn't feel like this was a story that Kendall or Kylie was excited to tell. It doesn't feel like a manuscript Man Maya Sloan was happy to write, or even she was paid well to write it. And it doesn't feel like there was a story that anyone was asking for. It feels like Kylie and Kendall Jenner were sat down one day and angrily ordered to write a book by their producers who run their life, and they got out of it by just jotting down the most painfully obvious cliches that you can find in any YA fiction and handing them off to Maya Sloan to construct them into something vaguely book-shaped. When she asked for money, they slipped her a $20 bill and said, be lucky, that's all you're going to get. Now, admittedly, I haven't read any of the other Maya Sloan's work, but I would hope that anyone can write better than what I found in this, this schlock. Even some of the worst books I've read on this channel, I could always feel there was at least some sense of passion behind this work. Not always to equal levels, as I will say James Wesley Rawls clearly knows that no matter what he puts in his book, it'll be easily eaten up by his target audience. So he doesn't really have to try, and he knows that. And I can, But I can at least believe Rawls is passionate about the subject material in the work itself, even if he doesn't care to make it interesting. The Rising by Brian Keane. As disgusting as it was, and I rightfully labeled it as the worst book I had read in the year of 2023, before I'd even finished the year, I had felt that the author, as messed up as his constant focus on the essay of his female characters was, at least loved the concept of the story he was telling. In the past, this love of stories has even made me hesitate on doing book reviews. For example, there's this book I've read that's called The Knights of Ash by Sebastian Dorn. A few, I read it a few months ago. I really wanted to do a review on it, but I haven't found a good way to do it. 
Because while it is a book written with terrible writing, I want any review I make out of it to reflect that I respect and admire the passion he put in his book. Even if I don't think the story itself was very good and that the author seriously needs to work on how his story craft. I opened up this re review with my report card for a reason. Because I don't want there to be any illusion to how insepid this book truly is. A lot like eating tree bark simply to fill your stomach. This book has just no sense of... Mm. Now for those of you who don't know my marking system here, my tabs are color-coded with specific problems. Blue is the objective as I found in this book. This basically comes down to wrong words. It basically comes down to things like the wrong words used in a sentence, incomplete sentences that aren't a stylistic choice, things the book claim are fact which aren't. Uh, it's such like cow udders exploding when you don't milk them. Small things like that. Pink is plot related issues. Not often plot holes, but just as often contrivances, continuity errors, and so on. Orange typically relates to clunkiness or bad prose. Stuff that sounds wrong or just doesn't sit well on the brain when you read it, and thus disrupts the reading experience, often breaking the immersion of the reader. And finally, green, which is effectively my subjective tab. Typically, I label it as cringe, but it's more accurate to say that these are subjective viewpoints on why I think the book is very brought down. It does often relate to me cringing a little, obviously, but, th you know, it could be things like a character being a really big douchebag, but we're supposed to like them, and the story doesn't really seem aware that they're that big of a douchebag. Because of this, green will op often be the most common color used, as reading is ultimately a subjective experience for many people. And no matter how terrible I find a book, there probably will always be someone else out there who will say that this was their favorite book of all time. And that's fine. It's why Green exists, to show my personal opinion. So you can imagine my shock when I'm reading through this book. I get to the end, and I realize that Green is the second least used tab out of the four. The fact that Pink, the, my plot-related tabs, are the most numerous tab in this book should scare a lot of you. Honestly, I don't, I don't think it's an exaggeration when I say almost every chapter has a plot-related issue. And, and I want to be clear, all the tabs you see now, that's the initial reading of my book. This is the stuff I picked up on, on my first read-through, as I'm just going through the book. It's not the total count of all the plot issues I found, because as I was writing this review, I realized there was at least... 10 more that I had missed. So actually, that pink count should be 48. And just, I just... So it's really not an exaggeration when I say there's maybe two chapters in this entire book that does not have a plot issue. When it came to that, I was at kind of a loss of how I was supposed to review this book. I was really unsure because my typical format, my typical script format where I go into the book and I basically sum up my main issues by in sections talking about, you know, here characters suck and here's why, so let's move on to plot, and this sucks, here's why. I don't think that's going to work because there's just so much wrong with this book. So I'm going to, I actually decided that I got to go the route of my first libertarian book review or my initial plan of how to review Yuma's crime, crime wave was. I have to go through this book chapter by chapter and explain to you just how terrible this book is to read because someone has to do it and I don't think Crimson Rogue is gonna needs to suffer through this book like it, it, it by some miracle that guy is watching my channel love the channel by the way uh but <laughs> don't torture yourself man don't do this book just just don't <laughs> please Spare yourself the mental anguish of this book. That being said, if you do if you do make the video, I'm gonna watch the shit out of it. So, anyways, let's go ahead and start. We get to one of the first. We get to one of the only chapters that doesn't have a plot related issue. At least not at first. The prologue. So, 
The prologue is a real simple story. It's just telling a story about in the distant past about how a man who was seen crazy by his people begins to dig up through the earth to try to get back to the surface after some great cataclysmic event forced all of humanity beneath the earth. And at the very end, his his brother, who we notably don't find out is his twin brother till near the end of the book, Pin. But it immediately starts off and just gives you a bad impression. Literally, page two. You're already at a point where you realize that whoever wrote this book doesn't have the greatest grasp of prose. Because near the because the author keeps trying to switch up what is a unique writing style for them. And none of them really work. For example, one of the things that bugged me a lot by this is the amount of ands that the author uses. For example, and that is why he also left his wife and son and daughter behind, promising to come back when he finally had the sky overhead. He wrapped them in his arms and kissed them all goodbye, then left to assemble his men. You would think, oh, it's a stylistic choice at the time because they keep using and, and, and. You know, that's five ands in the span of two sentences. Which, if you don't know, you want to avoid using the same word constantly because not only does it look tacky when you write, but it also it also creates that, that the dissonance in that word. You ever notice when you say or write a word enough times, you realize, oh, that doesn't look right anymore. Is that a real word? Yeah, that, that's what happens when you use a word too often. You, you, make, you make the audience very aware of the word. This is a result of a psychological phenomenon called semantic satiation, and it's pretty weird. But another thing you also notice is that the book has a very detached writing style. Now, I mentioned this a bit in the last review I did of The Founders, how we, it's hard to get attached to the characters because a lot of the time... A lot of their major moments is very detached. We're being told it like we're being told a biography written years later, where the author didn't actually, where the character telling the events doesn't actually, isn't currently experiencing it. They're relating their experiences later in life, and that that works well with the um, the tense that this book is written in, but it doesn't do well in things like this. Mind you, we're, com we're completely separated from every other character. In fact. As far as I'm concerned, they probably shouldn't have given us this prologue because it kind of ruins the theme they go for at the end, and it reveals this biggest twist that I think we're supposed to find out in the next book. But whatever. But li 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 literally, listen to this. Yet these men who attacked were not savages or mutants or marred by pollution and interbreeding. Atros? He saw the man he once called brother knife a grunt no more than 16 cycles. More of his men died around him as Andrew continued to swing his sledge, breaking bone wherever it landed. His arms cried through the strain, drill engine hammering away. Or, the drill engine hammered away. My bad. By the time Atros and his men took the camp, they had left only three men alive, but wounded. All three would surely die. None would remain to remember the truth of the attack. Andrew was forced to kneel at Atros's feet, the drill engine now silent, its operated kill in his chair. Why? Andrew asked his brother, mind reeling, betrayed by his own people, his own brother. The world will not be yours, Atros says. It will be greater than that. Know that your journey was not in vain. Your plans will continue, but you will not see them through. And then, looking into his brother's eyes, Andrew was killed. So, one of the things that bothers me most about this little section here is this guy was just betrayed. Again, we found out later that this is his twin brother. So, this guy was just betrayed by his twin brother, and we don't feel that betrayal. We don't, we don't really feel... This guy might as well have been betrayed by an acquaintance he briefly mentioned this, this expedition to in a bar, for all the emotional resonance that were given in this moment. Because, literally, it's just, oh my god, that's my brother. Okay. But that's kind of, that is literally how it feels when this is revealed. And then we move on to the second prologue. Now, I know this says chapter one, but make no mistake, this is a second prologue. The basics of this chapter is really, is really just, we get a bunch of exposition on, this, on how Indra works as a society, as Livia, one of our two main characters, 
talks about her coming emergence ball, which is basically the equivalent of like a quinceanera, bar mitzvah, that kind of thing. It's meant to showcase her evolution into an adult world, and she's supposed to find her husband here and all that. So there's really not much in-depth information that you need to know. I think at most, the only thing that this contributes is the fact that Livia is an orphan. Uh, she has the last horse on Earth, and she's not like other girls, guys. I will say, though, in Chapter 1, there is a uh, there is a particularly interesting quote in here. And this is one of those... Most of the time, I try not to do too much research on the author before I finish reading a book, because I don't want that, again, to taint my perception. But um, it's kind of hard when you know the Jenners are just the Kardashians. I mean, they're like... They're the most famous family for doing nothing. So, obviously, I was going in with at least some idea of who these people were. So, when I read stuff like um, like this, it, it kind of feels very hypocritical. Now, genetic research and implementation have evolved into something else entirely. Geneticists specialize in enhancements. Dimple insertion, skin replenishment, skeletal adjustment. Nothing that changes the world, just your appearance. Governess begged me to get a chest alteration before the party season. No need to inflate for the whole evening, she confided. Only your debut entrance, and perhaps for the formal dinner. I refused again and again, and she would sigh, whole body crumpling as though I'd stabbed her with my zinger. Zinger is just a, a sword. It's a, um, just, just imagine it as a rapier. Governess believes in enhancements with the same intensity she believes in perfectly tied waist sas sashes. Her own face ceased changing when she began her yearly visits to the Rejuvenation Island Clinic. You could not discern her age unless you noticed the dullness in her eyes. She had yet to have the sparkle put back in, which is a very painful procedure. So, if there's one thing that everyone knows about the Kardashians, in fact, it's kind of a truth in Hollywood, sadly, is that people just destroy themselves with plastic surgery. And it's no exception with the Jenners. Uh, for, for, this is liter literally, look, th this is an example of just how much plastic surgery they do to themselves over the course of the time. So, yeah, that I found that really rich coming from the, uh, coming from the Kardashians of all people. Uh, but one of the, th th again, this is another chapter where uh, there's obviously no plot issues because we're still only two chapters in. Uh, I guess maybe there's three chapters without plot issues. But, uh... Uh, this is just one of those cases where, again, it's showcasing how the writing style continues to deteriorate. Um, for example, it's like, the, the, one of the weird things that this book tries to do, at least for a little bit, is that it always tries to end things on a zinger. And not, not the sword that she has, but rather, you know that, like, um, that one sentence, one sentence zinger, so to speak. Where they say something that's supposed to sound cool and it's like an action movie line. You asked me to come say goodbye. Sayonara. So, uh, you notice that a lot in this chapter. Like, to the point where I actually started a count on this chapter and I just, I gave up about five chapters later because it just got to the point where I was like, oh my god, are you serious? Like, like it, it, even to the point where they're completely unnecessary. Like this section here. My mother, according to the governess, or according to governess, I, I'm going to talk about that later. I, again, just remember, pen number one. My mother, according to governess, was a charming conversationalist and a graceful dancer. Governess tells me all about my mother, and she often repeats herself. There's only so much to tell, only so many stories. I know that she designed her own formal wear and enjoyed berries and chocolate after dining, that she favored the color blue, and wore one long braid down, the ba down her back, unless the occasion dictated a more formal updo. I know a great deal about my mother, and yet nothing at all. See, that's not a bad zinger, but at the same time, it's unnecessary because you'd already cleverly established that she doesn't know anything about her mother except the stories other people tell. So when you, when you just come out and say that in a zinger, you kind of ruin the, ruin the moment. Uh, but it keeps going, like, legitimately, the, 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 even the pages afterwards, literally the paragraph afterward has a zinger. A sudden rush of cold smacks me across the face, the air of the clouds growing stronger. Faster, I tell Veda. 
I pass the hedge maze and tranquility pastures, roar underneath the welcoming gate. Not that anyone is really welcome, not to Helix Island. And it's just like, it keeps going. Even better, I will pin the blame on heartbreak. My impending code of habitation means leaving you, dear governess. You are the closest I have ever had to a mother. That should quiet her quickly. Strangely enough, the sentiment is true. My bad. There is one plot hole in this. Again, like I've said, if you've noticed, like I, like I said, one of those several plot holes in here that I didn't notice at the time because at the time there wasn't enough established for it to be a plot hole. But here, she says, strangely enough, the sentiment is true, that her governess is the closest thing she has to her mother. Except later on in this book, a character is established named Marius, who is the closest thing she has to a mother, to the point she tries to get Marius to adopt her. So in this retrospect, the governess is not the closest thing she has to a mother. So I'm going to guess that just slipped through editing, and uh, that, that, that governess probably was supposed to have Marius' role, and it just got changed over time. But yeah, it just... But yeah, you also get more and more awkwardness. Honestly, I was still a little bit hopeful when this chapter ended, though, because one of the cool things it was doing, at least for this chapter and this chapter alone, it, it drops it like really quickly afterwards... Uh, is that we see an excerpt from some of the world's literature. Now, one of the cool things that I like, Hell Followed With Us did this, is that we see excerpts from the world. We see it being told through the eyes of people pro publishing propaganda, publishing works, and all that. So it gives us a good insight of how this world works outside of our main characters. And it, it really is nice. But it's not done well in this book. It only ever pops up when it's directly related to the plot, which isn't terrible of an idea. It, it's so infrequent, and because it's at the end of the chapter, it's no longer foreshadowing. It's just, yeah, you've already established this in the chapter before. Why are you why are you telling us again? You, you literally said, this is what Indra says about this particular subject, so why are you mentioning it again? Anyways, that was only two chapters in. God, isn't this fun? So... We go to chapter 2. This is the introduction of Lex, our other main character. Now the main idea is that this is about Lex when she is first taken to the orphanage, uh, how she's ostracized as a young age because she, again, is not like other girls, and how she meet, briefly meets with an older girl named Samantha, who takes care of her and seems to take the role of a bigger sister to her. But at, the, at almost the age of 13, Samantha is suddenly ripped away from her and no one will tell her what happened. This causing her to turn into a more angry, fist as the talking for me kind of girl. Which, you know, it's fine. So, uh, again, I'll go into that later. I have so much to talk about when it comes to this book. So overall, this is... But the start of the book immediately tells you something that's, again, not going to work well in this book's favor. This, this, this chapter, though, tells you two very important things. First, the, most, the more minor of one, is that it's a dual first-person POV book. I've been in no secret in the past that I really don't like dual first-person POV. I don't like having more than one first-person point of view in the entire book. And that's mostly because authors typically can't write their characters separate enough for it to really matter. How to Marry Keanu Reeves in 90 Days was a great example. Um, one of the things is you had a great dichotomy between the characters that would have justified the, the dual first person POV, but the author never took advantage of it. The moment you would switch over to someone else's POV, they would just adopt all those traits that she was more comfortable writing from the first person. And then when you left it, that's when they'd lose those traits again. So that's a minor nitpick. Uh, I'll have to talk about it a little bit more later when it becomes more relevant why it's not great and how they could have used it to good. So, to move on, one, the other thing you'll notice, and this kind of ties into the f dual first-person POV, is that this is an anachronistic book. Now, for those of you who don't know what that means, that means the events of the story are not happening necessarily in chronological order. The first chapter starts with you telling you that it's the day before 
Livia's emergence ball. Again, like I said, that's like a quinceanera. Uh, I, I guess she's turning 16. I'm assuming she's 16. I don't remember the, her age ever explicitly being said. But, so she's turning 16. Chapter 1 starts with Lex as a baby. And there are several points in here where Liv is literally a week away from her, her emergence ball. And then we suddenly cut back to Lex, who's about to take her final exam. And in the context of the world, this final exam had to have taken place almost a month before this emergence ball. So, again, and the problem is, the problem is, the worst part about this is we don't even get a time scale on Lex's events until chapter 6, which is 76 pages into the book. That's a little under a fourth of the way of the entire book before we finally get a decent timeline on Lex's events. At the same time, you think, oh, is this happening while Liv is an adult? Oh, I guess, never mind. Liv is back to being a kid next chapter. It just leads to a confusing narrative because you never know when something is happening and what hasn't happened yet to this world, but has happened on this storyline. So is this taking place before this or is this taking place before the... This book also has an issue with writing kids. Uh, one of the things that it does is it just really, like, again, it really tries to stretch that our two main characters are not like other girls, guys. Because they're, they're, they're always the outcasts. Now, I, I got more to say on that later. But for now, it's just kind of one of those kids don't even act like kids in this book. And it doesn't make sense. Like, take, take a listen to this. Rukuda walked, through, walked the roads, inspecting the quiet babies, the ones whose parents never smiled at them, never sang or bounced them on their knee. All they got were the caretakers, who didn't hug or kiss or hold your hand. So these ba babies never learned to emote. Their faces completely made of stone. Orphan babies never cry. They, never, they rarely make noise at all. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. Crying is instinctual. <laughs> That's crying is instinctual. They they cry because that is what our instincts tell us. Another thing that I, I although I won't fault the Jenners for not knowing this, or I guess the Kardashians. I don't know what I'm supposed to call them, but I won't fault the Kardashians of all people for not knowing this. I'm kind of surprised they know how to tie their shoes based on some of the stuff I've seen from this show, but. It actually turns out that smiling and stuff is also kind of instinctual acts for humans. Kids who are born blind, who have never seen adults smile or frown or anything, they still show those emotions on their face. So that's this is one of those blue tabs where it's just factually wrong. But one of the things, one of the first plot holes I actually marked here before you know that i just noticed was automatically not good and it's, it's one of my favorite things about this book like just read this out of context to someone and you realize wait what listen to this my memory is good but not good enough to penetrate the infant haze something to do with undeveloped brains prevents us from remembering those years but i did manage to snatch my hollow file off the recruiter's desk one visit He's been cursed with a small bladder and doesn't have the influence to get it modded. So his trips to the receptacle were frequent during testing. Rakuta would have taken it with him, but how did he know he, I could read? I didn't even know myself. I was only three. He hadn't administered that test yet. And this isn't just Lex that's born with the ability to read. Liv flat out says that too. I already knew how to read, though no one had told me how. That's not how that works. And, and don't get me wrong. It's revealed later on that both Lex and Livia have supernatural powers. But them being able to read is never brought up as a supernatural power. It literally feels like it's in there because, oh, I don't want to write these characters learning how to read. They already know how to read by age three. Yeah, that's right. The super smart guys. Now... I will say, though, starting here, I will give one defense of the book. One of the many things I saw on Goodreads when people would talk about this book is that they would say that the two characters are pretty much the same character. And I'm going to go ahead and disagree with that. The two characters are pretty distinct from each other in certain ways. 
I wouldn't necessarily say they're good characters, but they are distinct. Lex, for example, is a raving bitch. The story wants us to sell us on this girl who's angry and lashing out at the world, but it be she becomes so unlikable at moments that it's really hard to sympathize with her, as she'll start fights with people for little to no reason, and even ignores the people who are trying to be nice to her just so she can sit in the corner and sulk about how she's not liked by anyone else. She, like, she has a very massive victim complex, and the story is unaware of it. Livia is a bit better, as she tends to be more composed, more stoic, more of a product of the upper echelons of society. She is less distinct than Lex, I would argue. She doesn't really have a strong, whoo, that's a personality trait, but she is different. I do typically know who I'm reading about when I'm reading the chapters without having to be told. So yeah, I'm going to end up going more into that when they finally do meet, but they don't meet till like halfway through the book. So fair warning on that. On to chapter three. Now chapter three goes back to Livia. It's typically how this does for a while is it'll, each chapter will be from a different point of view up until near the end where it just switches POVs in the middle of the chapter, but I'll get to that. So basically the big focus of this chapter is the introduction to the etiquette lessons that Livia has to undergo and the bully character for Livia. Pin in this. But honestly, that's kind of it. Uh, the plot, <laughs> technically it introduces two bully characters. The first and the actual girl her age and for some reason the etiquette teacher in this the, the, the I shouldn't say the because the book never uses the so etiquette teacher also very much just bullies on Livia for no discernible reason whatsoever she just shows up hi my name's Livia Cosmos fuck you you little shit that, that's pretty much how it goes there's, there's no reason for the bullying so like hell even Harry Potter had the decency to give Snape a good reason to hate James, and thus, by extension, Harry. Now, this takes about this, this chapter takes place about ten years before the main events of the book. It, it really, it really kind of sets an establishment. Um, one of the things that I did notice here is there's there's a lot of pointless scenes. And that's another blue mark is a scene that's in the book but has no bearing whatsoever to the book or anything else. Like, like this scene right here. Waslow looked me up and down, as he often did, though his reaction was somewhat surprising. He appeared pleased. Very good, governess. I am glad we had our discussion. This was long before my own discussions started, yet I already liked the, disliked the word. The three, Marius, Waslow, and governess, stared down at me in heavy silence, their expressions making me squirm. The shuttle is ready, said Marius, Breaking the quiet, she leaned down, giving me a comforting smile. Are you ready, my love? For the first time, I wasn't quite sure. And the reason that doesn't work is because literally before the two section breaks, which put this little chapter on its own island, we already established that it was time to go. For a moment, I thought governess might cry, something I'd never seen her do. Instead, she squeezed my hand, fluffed my ruffles, and stood abruptly. Time to go, little one. You can literally cut out this entire chapter, toss it to the side, and nothing is lost in this section. One of the things that is not just... Now, the plot the plot hole of this... Not plot hole. I get... Yeah, I guess kind of a plot hole. Or plot... More of a continuity tip, I suppose. But one of the things about this chapter, that it's resident plot issue, is it introduces the fact that Livia's feelings towards flying changes every chapter hell it changes in the middle of the sentence our transport hurtled through the sky dodging other shuttles and speeding around the edges of the island my stomach jumping up with each turn i pushed my face against the window but the view went by too quickly clouds blue sky islands transporters the sky was more active when you were in it not standing on solid ground so one of the things that bothers me about this is she's a kid who's terrified of flying so she shoves her face against the window and watches the most terrifying part of her flying. I talked about it a little bit in my Fear the Booktuber tag, but there was one thing that, as a kid, 
literally, I think, about Liv's age here. There was this thing my grandparents had. It was just like this little raccoon thing here that I was absolutely terrified of. I, I have no idea why. I really don't. I, I could not explain to you why this thing terrified me as a kid. But I was terrified of it. So you know what I did? I stayed the hell away from it. If I even so much as glimpsed it in a room, I would take long ways around that house. You know, oh, it's in the sitting room, which is required to get to my grandparents' room. Well, I guess I'm going outside, going all the way around and re-entering the house from the back door so I don't have to see that thing. So, yeah. And this is also where I'm going to go ahead and say I fucking hate the naming schemes of this book. So, let's go ahead and talk about pin number one. Because the naming schemes of this book, like, oh my god. At first, it was a little charming, and it, it did have the, at least the, the reason to say, okay, maybe Indra isn't very creative as a society. And even if it is intentional, it's just not very good. Like, I gotta be honest with you, the further in I go, and the more things I get introduced to that just have such a stupid naming scheme... I literally was like, oh my god, that was so stupid. Because it does showcase in this book that things can be named not along this naming scheme. Just, you know what, I'm just going to read a couple of these for you. There are things in this book, such as, every person in this book is not a governess or the governess. They are governess. That is their name. The governess, life coach, teacher. Then there's titles which are just so uninspiring oh Livia is not just a little girl she is proper little girl and she's gonna grow up into proper young woman and pre meet a proper young man she'll do this by being at etiquette lessons where she undergoes pleasant interaction people don't get married they undergo cohabitation where they become proper cohabitated women of Indrithian society they practice for their own emergence ball grand diner. They will learn reliance on others to affirm our femininity. Could you get any more uncreative? Like, oh my god, you kept governess. You kept etiquette. You apparently should have just named something like the etiquette teacher. Teacher of how to react properly in Endorthian society. Because that's about as fucking creative as the rest of the naming scheme of this book. I, I genuinely, I, I don't know how to express this further to you guys. The naming conventions of this book are just so creatively bankrupt that you'll want to literally drive your head through the nearest wall just to make it stop. And we're only three chapters in, by the way. It only gets worse from here. There'll be more on there, don't worry. So, let's go ahead and move on to chapter four. Chapter 4 is about how Lex is approved to go to academy training, where she's basically going to military school. Not that you'll ever know. Uh, you'll know, you'll meet her bully character, see some of the academy life, and you're introduced to the Book of Indra concept. See? Didn't last long before I had to add another one. So notably speaking, this isn't a terrible chapter on its own. Um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm going to keep a pin in that bully thing instead of talking about it here because it's more relevant later. But um, one of the things that I thought was so stupid about this is the Academy motto. And it's it just, listen to this motto underneath the sign. Be industrious. Be vigilant. Behave. Not only is it such... It, it's based on a stupid fucking pun. But... How is that a motto for military? Like, the other things are be vigilant. Be industrious. You know, it's it gets hard sometimes to talk about just how stupid something is. But it, that's basically this, the main main damage of this chapter because this is this is one of the chapters it does have a plot plot issue unfortunately but uh mostly because we're introduced to Cassina's hate 
The, okay, so Huboli Casina. Huboli is Casina. And we're literally introduced to her before... We're told she hates her before we even meet her. Like, literally, they gave me new shoes, real ones, instead of pass me down slippers. They gave me a cadet badge. They gave me a sleeper pod. They gave me Casina right next door. Well, you can't get everything. Except at this point, you don't fucking know who Casina is, so this means nothing. Like, literally, all they had to do was wait a couple more pages, and then you would have understood, oh, yeah, okay, that's kind of funny. But no. No. But th there are really dumb parts. There's also another plot tiff here. Sure, his approaching me could have been a setup, but he wasn't much bigger than me. I could take him if I had to. Honestly, it might do a few things for my rep. She says this literally less than a page after she's told, hey, if you start another fight in this academy, we're going to expel you and throw you to rock bottom. Which is literally rock bottom. Like, fucking... Just Spongebob has more creative naming schemes than this. That's all I'm going to say. Where is this, Spongebob? Rock bottom. But the most part, it's it's mostly an issue of clunkiness. Like, like listen to this. This is a... This is a, one of those, the author clearly used too strong of a word. It wasn't necessarily the wrong word, but just too strong of a word for what they were trying to convey. I followed him down the path as Casina slaughtered me from afar with jealous whispers. That made me smile. I didn't let him see, of course. So, right here, slaughtered is clearly the wrong word, because if she was slaughtering you, that means you felt genuine pain at the at the faces she was throwing at you. Assaulting, maybe, is the word you're looking for, because that implies she's attacking you, it doesn't imply it's hurting you, though. When you say slaughter, that's such a strong word that it's not invoking the same thing you think it is. So, yeah. Some clunky exposition, some clunky prose, like this. Guess that's why he overlooked the fact that I was unpredictable and obviously hated his breathing guts. You know, as opposed to just hated his guts. The breathing was completely un unnecessary there and stops and makes you think, wait, what? The author also wants to remind you that her, her one of her main characters can lapse better than everyone else. And so on, so on. Really not much to talk about chapter four. Isn't that exciting? Chapter 5. So, chapter 5... So, chapter 5 is probably one of the better chapters of this book, mostly because there's really not that much wrong with it. It does have some dumb moments. Uh, it's mostly just some more of the etiquette training. The book really continues to push Livia's social ostracization from her peers. And she finally gets won over on her bully of an etiquette teacher by expertly performing at one of the tasks, despite the fact that she hasn't been very good at many of the others. It's, again, overall, it's not a good chapter. Um, it, this is important for later. The, the, the task that she uh, she does really good is the fact that they put her, for some reason, again, I'll talk about this later, they put her up on a giant spinning platform and she has to keep a balance the entire time without looking ruffled, which I'll talk about it later again. But she excels at that because she does a whole bunch of fencing training. Ah, uh, don't get me wrong, there, there are some pretty fucking dumb scenes here. Like, uh, like, the, the, again, not kind of one of those plot holes. Today we learned reliance on others to affirm our femini a femini femininity. I told her, an etiquette t tutor has a had us affect the state of one who has become incapacitated due to physical injury and must remain fetching while awaiting a proper young gentleman to rescue her. Now, I get what the authors are going for here, but the problem is they don't take into account their setting when they do this stupid scene because... The idea of teaching a young girl, again, to just lie there and look pretty while she waits for rescue has merit if you're really pushing the idea of the patriarchal society they live in. But the, the problem with this is it doesn't make sense in the context of the world because the, the, her peers and the people she associates with, 
live on isolated islands. So even from a logical standpoint, it doesn't make any sense because basically what they're teaching them is, oh, just sit there and scream until by chance a guy who is on an island where only one other guy probably is or, you know, the people you think are below you see you. But make sure you look good because if you don't look good while screaming for help, then you, you awful, get out. You sit there and starve while looking pretty kind of thing, you know? There's also another small plot hole here where, okay, so one of the small plot holes here, at the very least, it, it is at the time because at this point, you, you're kind of introduced to a character that Livia is, but not it, it doesn't relate to how, who she becomes. Like, at this point, Livia is still very much trying very hard to be a proper young girl, and she's striving to get appreciation from others. And as the start of a chapter tells us, this is only six years before her before her emergence ball. Which makes me wonder, like, when I was first reading this through, it's kind of like, okay, so you're skipping entire years at a time. But, so when we get to the next one, it's not going to make any sense so that she's suddenly this person that she was in the very first chapter who doesn't care about any of the social conventions of a world, would rather tear her dress off and go splatter around in the mud, that kind of thing. It doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't connect properly. And they don't pay enough attention to it to make it connect properly. Overall, despite all this, though, <clears throat> overall, despite all this, though, the book was giving me some hope that, oh, maybe it's getting better. Now it's got its clunky exposition out of the way. Maybe it's getting better. Chapter 6. This is mostly about Lex being in military school, and we see her play a game of what is effectively Quidditch. That that's yeah, that's the easiest way to describe it. It's basically dodgeball and soccer put together, and that's that's about it. Yeah, actually, you know what? I think it's closest to rugby. Yeah, I don't often consider rugby, but it's probably the closest to rugby that you'll get in this world. So I guess saying it's Quidditch is a little unfair. But as you can tell from my previous. For my expression when I said chapter 6, there are multiple problems with this chapter. For example, this is the first time you're going to realize... Okay, so first, it finally opens and gives us a time scale for Lex. Oh, it's only 76 pages into the book. I'm glad I finally know why I'm at the timeline for her. But it doesn't... The final exam does not line up with Livia's... Emergence ball, and you don't learn that till later. So, remember, you never know where you are on the timeline here. But one of the other things that this book very clearly tells you is, for all intents and purposes, Lex is not military. She is effectively maybe going to a juvie school, but she's not going to military. We never see her training, we never see her sparring, we never see her, you know learn like studying squad tactics learning basic military you know marching learning how to be a squad we never see any of this so for all intents and purposes lex again may as well just be in juvie school not military academy second the terrible writing of this book like this this futuristic dodgeball game there's like it keeps it takes up half the chapter and actually most of the chapter and the author doesn't even feel the need to add any attention to it once they get what they wanted to do about the chapter out of the way which is Casino throws a ball at our character's head because literally this is how it does it while our character's reeling from the attack and you know steadying herself she's got people rallying around her she says so tell me who's gonna get the goal there's no rush of hands being erased but there was one Vippy I looked in the direction of a raised hand. You better. Well, she didn't score. She didn't even come close. But neither did Cassina's team, so I counted it a tie game as a personal victory. Wow, that was so great. I'm glad you really went with the tension here and showed us them coming together as a squad. Oh, my bad. I forgot. The authors don't give a shit about any ca cadet in Lex's life apart from Kane. Which makes begs the question why Vippy even fucking exists. But I'll get into that. Actually, you know what? Fuck it. I'll go into it right now. 
Namely speaking, this is when you kind of realize that Lex has a very big victim complex and she's kind of a bitch to people who are trying to be friends with her. And this also kind of ties into the fact that my biggest one, Livia and Lex are undergoing the exact same story. I'm actually not kidding. Once you reach this chapter, you sort of stop and realize, wait a minute, Liv and Lex are undergoing the exact same story. It's different environments, but the stories are the same. Both move into an academy where they aren't welcome because of their orphan because they're orphans. In that academy, they establish a rivalry with a peer of theirs who looks down on them because of their orphan status and because that peer of theirs believes they're on a higher plane than they are, often throwing their wealth and etiquette in their face. Both of them experience extreme social isolation because of this peer and their, you know, their society in which they pull. And both both are going from someone who's trying to fit into the world that they are in and eventually realizing this world isn't doing anything but hurting them before eventually deciding I'm going to rebel against this world for what makes me happy. Again, they go in the exact same way. And it doesn't make sense because they aren't living anywhere near the same life. It makes sense. Cassina is in military school. Actually, she's not even in military school. This is just flat out they're being trained in the military. And numerous times it's brought up, yeah, my family's really high up. And it's kind of like, then why are you here? This is kind of one of those things that's brought up multiple times is that there's a bunch of people from higher echelons of the Indra society, and they came down here for some reason. But they look down on anyone who's below them. And it, it, they act like it's not a conscious choice, but I don't remember them ever saying that they're being forced to join. So it makes you wonder, okay, so why do they care? Why are they here? If they look so far down upon people like Lex, who eventually becomes a special ops soldier... Why do they care about being in the PCF or the Population Control Force? Again, not a creative naming scheme and not subtle in the slightest. Even further, they honestly could have easily differentiated these two. For example, the whole point, like, because they go through the exact same things. There's going to be a later point in the book where I'm really going to have to point out why this doesn't work, but... To namely put, why don't they make the differences a physical and psychological? For example, Cassina could have represented a far more physical threat, being the person who always challenges Lex physically. But to separate herself from Livia, Lex has a very strong emotional support behind her, with Kane and Vippy, who two, her two peers who desperately try to get along with her, and teachers who don't seem to have it out for her are more interested in making her the best person they can be. So you can show that while she's being physically harmed much more than Livia, she's different because she does still have that emotional support behind her. Meanwhile, Micah as a bully could have represented the more psychological aspect that Livia suffers and more accurately represent the social isolation she feels. Start them off as genuine friends, but slowly show how Micah's conformity to the system that shows them how Micah's conformity with the system that they're expected to live in caused her to turn her back on Livia and slowly makes single Livia out as the black sheep among the herd. Honestly, I, I kind of thought that's what they were going to go for in this suggestion because I, I kind of actually thought Micah was going to be revealed to have a crush on Livia. And I want to put a pin in this because it becomes much more relevant later. Chapter 7. There's really nothing of note in this chapter. It's just more Attica lessons. We see them bring back we see them trying to bring back corsets, but they call them cinches for some reason. Wait, never mind, I know why, because the uncreative naming scheme, it cinches the waist, as opposed to just fucking calling it a corset. You're calling him a governess, why not just keep the corset? But mostly, this book just has a lot of small continuity snarls within itself. Uh, one is that Livia goes back to being super excited about air travel again. 
So, <laughs> okay. So, the number one problem I have with this book, not book, uh, the one thing that we learn in this chapter, though, is the Kardashians clearly don't understand what fucking fencing is. The, the first few pages of this book are not... The, the one, two... The first four pages of this book are Livia undergoing a mental simulation of fighting a samurai warrior with her fencing skills. The problem is doesn't work because one samurais didn't fence so this would be the completely wrong skill set here but it, it goes beyond that and it's literally like she's having a genuine anime duel have you <laughs> i think the best way i can actually describe it is if anyone's seen sucker punch it's basically that that first that first dream within a dream sequence I pose, my zinger down, humming, my body prickling with energy. The samurai's face is rigid with concentration, barely a muscle flickering. His mind is clear. I know this from Master. He's been telling me since we first began training when I was a little girl. The true warrior is empty of emotion. I close my eyes and force my mind to go blank. No emergence ball, no sashes, no mica, no etiquette tutor, or lifeguard, or helix island. Only now, only the battle. An indiscernible rush of air. I know he la has launched into midair. I'm poised to attack before even opening my eyes. I leap, my rigid body cutting through space. In that brief moment of flight, I feel every hair of my arm rising. All it takes is the space between two heartbeats. Our blades clash. We spin away from each other. Our weapons lock the whole while. Our dance is violent. His face is inches from mine, lips drawn over his teeth, a growl rising in his throat. The zinger releases a low note as I force him away. The impact throws me off balance. I land on my feet and stumble, disoriented, trying to catch my breath and regain focus. My eyes scan the garden frantically. Where could he have gone? A low groan. I turn just as he charges, eyes mellow, his form perfect. An unexpected beam of sunlight glittens off his katana's edge, blinding me. Reminder! Every point up into this, she's called her swordmanship fencing. So she's doing all this, not with a similar katana, not with a broadsword, but with a rapier or an epi or one of those. And I got to tell you, that's not how you fight with fencing. Now, I'm not going to claim I'm a sword expert, but it takes about five minutes of research to see the difference between how someone fights with a katana and how someone fights with a fucking rapier. You're basically telling me that a musketeer fighting a samurai would look exactly the same as if a samurai was fighting another samurai. You know what? That'd be kind of cool. Musketeer versus Samurai. Is Deadliest Warrior still on the air? Oh no, they, they got cancelled. Someone can come on from in contact with Death Battle. Well, other than that, it's mostly just a bunch of small continuity tips throughout the chapter. Uh, like, she, she goes from hating, she goes to suddenly being excited about air travel again and liking it. Marius' driver is a skill that she proclaims. He races across the sky, dodging shuttles and rigs, swooping through clouds. Due to our status, we're allowed to cut through islands, restricted airspace. Rigs and other craft must secure permits. That is why Helix is often left unlooked upon, even from afar. The ride is so exciting, I nearly forget where I'm heading. If it were only so easy. So, she's back to loving it again. There's another point here where she says, Micah makes little effort to hide hers. She's always been a pie... Oh, hold on, let me, let me read the first. I glance around the room, and see, but the girls avoid my gaze. Glaring, as they are well aware, will be highly detasteful. Distasteful. Micah makes little effort to hide hers. She was always the pioneer when it comes to hating me. Except that's not true because we see the first part, Micah and you are pretending at least to be friends, so she's not the pioneer in hating you. 
If anyone's a pioneer and hating you, it's your fucking etiquette teacher who literally started off just wanting to smack you, apparently. But the, the whole scene it's related to is kind of stupid because, again, we're, we're talking again about how much Micah hates her. And in reality, it, it does, the, the example she shares doesn't make sense because she's talking about the sash training and she talks about how Micah convinced her to go off and hide with her. Where her and where Micah cut her thumb, and that she cuts her thumb, and they put bloody fingerprints inside their sashes together. Except it doesn't make sense because Livia later says that she realized this was just an effort to prove that she could cut Livia, to prove that she can make Livia do whatever she wants. Because what she noticed was that her cut was much deeper than the cut Micah made on herself. Except that doesn't make sense. If it was to prove she could cut you, all she would have to do is cut you, not herself. The whole point of her cutting herself and putting the thumbprint in was completely unrelated to that. And again, this comes back into more factual air. You can easily cut someone. Your mind, you can easily cut someone deeper than you cut yourself unintentionally. Your mind is very much against her hurting itself. You cannot hurt yourself as easily as you can hurt someone else. Perfect example is your bite force. You can try, like, just sit there and try to bite down as hard as you can on your thumb. You'll notice that although you can hurt yourself, you never bite through your thumb. And that's not true because your, my, your mouth has enough bite force to literally chomp your thumb off like a carrot. But your brain is like, hey, you idiot, don't chew your own thumb off. So naturally, you can't bite your own thumb off normally. I'm going to guess there are a couple people out there who could probably ignore that signal and just bite their own thumb off. So please don't try it. I'm not actually, I'm not actually telling you to try to bite your own thumb off right now. Disclaimer. But it, it's to prove a point. So the whole Micah being, not cutting herself as deeply doesn't technically prove this. But overall, honestly, apart from the whole uh, not knowing what fencing is, it's really not that terrible of a chapter. It... Again, keep it in mind. Number five. Because we'll be coming back to this. We'll go ahead and move on to chapter eight. Honestly, this is mostly a chapter about how Kane and Lex are bonding with each other. And Lex, again, keeps forgetting how Vippy has repeatedly tried to be a friend and chooses instead to pretend she's a victim who everyone hates for no reason whatsoever. This, but this also kind of furthers the point because most of the time this is little, this literally is just a chapter of them bonding, which is needed. Don't get me wrong, so I'm not going to complain too much about that. But one of the things that this chapter does is it really reinforces how this is not military school. One, one of the things that ruins the image of this whole, this whole, this being a military academy is this little line here. Still, I catch her watching him. Her eyes follow him when, when he leaves the room. She loves him. I can tell. And it kills her that it only goes one way. Instead, she attaches herself to a new guy every rotation. She giggles and blushes, clings to his arm on the way to classes. Stares at him in the way that makes me want to puke. He will make a wonderful cohabitant, she tells others. Then dumps him. The breakup is always dramatic, usually in a crowd. You'll never understand me, she cries. Then races from the ration hall, st tears streaming. Her followers rush to support her. It seems to me Cassina's relationships have little to do with understanding. First of all, no fucking duh. You literally spelled out why she has these relationships. Second of all, this is a military school. Military. It, it's not even a school. It's a military academy. So how is she allowed to get away with making these constant dramatic scenes about dating fellow cadets? Especially when one of the big, big, big pushes of this is they have to listen and obey everything they're being told. It just doesn't make any logical... It just doesn't make sense to me. It, it does not sell that they're in a military academy in the slightest. But one thing that really bothered me about this scene is all of a sudden, Lex has a sudden hate of rock bottom. And you might... It, this doesn't make any logical sense. It comes completely out of nowhere. Even if you argue that she might hate her, made hate these rock bottomers because they made, because they sent her friend Samantha down there, 
That doesn't make sense because Lex has always been very aware that the system hates her, not rock bottom as in specific. So it's kind of one of those cases of all of a sudden we need to differentiate Lex more. So let's give her some more traits that she's a bitch. Oh, she hates all the poor people now. So let's move on to chapter nine. Chapter 9 is nothing of note, really. Uh, we, it shows mostly Marius and Livia bonding. There's some hint of the shadow person who's definitely not going to be one of her parents. Uh, and so on, stuff like that. It's just small character stuff, which is appreciated, but it doesn't mean anything. So it's really not that great. The main thing I had a problem with this is you begin to become very aware it's kind of a plot issue. You become very aware that the city of the Indra government literally just exists in a way that makes it super hard for anyone to live. It's kind of one of those, at a certain point you have to ask, what do they gain by making these laws? Tip, this is one of the issues I always have with YA bad dystopian governments is they're often portrayed as evil and nasty for no other reason than because they're evil and nasty. And a part of that issue it comes out with, it doesn't make logical sense. In fact, they'll often sabotage themselves. And it's like, dude, when you read other YA books, do you not take a moment to really think about it? Like, take for example, Hunger Games. A good thing about Hunger Games is, although the government is very evil, at least you understand why they do what they do. The Hunger Games aren't just because Boy, we really do like seeing those kids kill themselves. It's a punishment to the districts because they tried to rebel in the past and failed. So now they make them do this because it shows this is what happens when you fight us. We make your kids kill each other. So there's a reason they're doing these things as opposed to here. Why? And, and the point I'm bringing up is all of a sudden it's revealed that People can't adopt in this world because the city of Indra bans it. So why? What's the point of banning adoption? And, and don't get me wrong, in certain scenarios, yes, I, I can understand why you would ban adoption. I, and I can point to real world examples of why they're trying to ban adoption. Because, But then again, it connects logically to a different point. The city of Indra bans adoptions because they're assholes. That's it. That's the only reason they ban the adoption. I, I don't know. What's the point? I think I think the way the authors could have worked this is maybe adoptions not banned, but it's considered very uncouth for the upper Indra to adopt. Being sterile or being unable to produce your own child is seen as terrible. So if you adopt something must be wrong with you and that makes you bad and that basically socially ostracizes you not it's literally a law in the government and this is something even the night and its moon got right in that it had multiple times it would mention that oh that nobles would come to the orphanage that amorous and knox would stay at to adopt children but they would specifically choose out children that looked like them so they could pass them off as their own kids therefore Adoption is legal, they just don't adopt openly because it doesn't work. So anyways, let's move on to chapter 10. My god, chapter 10. <sighs> chapter 10 is Lexa's final exam. We basically see her going on a mission with Cassina as a squad leader. Cassina blatantly tries to get her killed by putting her in the most dangerous position. Kane volunteers to go with her. The two basically complete the job all by themselves because Cassina doesn't respond to their backup calls. This is very important to establish this. Kane is able to distract the monsters with sound paint that they're fighting. Uh, I guess I should be clear. The mission that they're going on is they're going down into rock bottom to break up a rave of cannibal monsters. No, they don't tell you this until after the mission's over. So yeah, it's another example of, it's going to tell me two chapters later what this mission actually was and why it served as the final exam. So yeah, love that. So anyways, after they, after, while they're getting surrounded, Kane is able to use, to distract the monsters with sound paint while Lex 
blows up the support to the building and then kills the leader when he emerges from the wreckage. And then it's all revealed to be a dream. Well, not a dream. Technically a simulation, but that's going to be important later. Kane kisses Lex. That one, I'm going to have to talk about in depth later. Kane kisses Lex because he doesn't want his first kiss to be with someone he doesn't know, which is he ominously tells her. And then Lex is assigned to the Rock Bottom Patrol, which is the special operations detail in the Indra government. Not that you'll ever know that, but whatever. So this whole chapter is fucking riddled with plot holes. For, okay, so the name thing, the main thing is the book doesn't want to tell you this is a simulation. So it has characters act like they're not in a simulation. Despite the fact that in this, they would know in universe they're in a simulation. Which means how they're acting doesn't make sense in context of the world. For example, Cassina tries to send De Lex to her death in a simulation. It's flat out. L listen to this. Lex, you'll take point from here on in, Cassina says. I look at her. She mistakes it for confusion. That means you'll be scouting the perimeter. I heard her the first time. The silence is on the ear feed. By the way, unnecessary clarification there. You don't need to say you heard her the first time because you already said she mistakes it for confusion. A one way, no return, a ride to failure. That's what all the cadets are thinking. Clearing a room is dangerous enough. Clearing a room with an entire... Clearing an entire mud cell is even worse. Being the first one in? Or... Being the first one in? Game over. There are options. Logical options. Send a recon team for initial surveillance. Disorient the enemy with a warning flashbuster. Just call it a fucking flash... But sending in a single cadet? We, we all know that is core low crazy. It's a setup. Of course I know that. Everyone does. Send me in. Get me killed off. I know the others are waiting on the air feed to hear my okay. My mind is racing. The fear is very real. I go in first, I think. Get demolished immediately. Casino orders the team to rush location, surprising already disoriented enemy, and taking the mud cell out. Casino leads us to victory. I fail. Theoretically, she could make this work. But it goes against everything we've been taught to value. The plan shows blatant disregard for her fellow cadets. For the people who have been trained to have her back, that is as core low as you get. Cassina hates me even more than I thought. She hates me enough to jeopardize her mission captain status. Now, I read that section because after Kane and Lex are able to completely fend off this thing and did it all by themselves we get this line Cassina remains in the simulation capital the look in her eyes distant and cold we made her look good and still her pointy face is pulled tight you outright said she wouldn't look good if anyone knew what she did and later on she doesn't respond to any of the calls for backup or signal for the squad to get into so how the hell does Cassina look good in this scenario at all? Remember, this is a simulation. They see everything happening right now. This isn't just Cassina is literally away from observers and they're doing an actual mission. They're literally sitting at a computer and they have people standing over there watching everything they do. So how does this make Cassina look good? Don't get me wrong. This isn't just Lex making a mistake. Cassina literally gets promoted into a high-ranking status because of this. And it doesn't make sense. Another plot hole is... Remember how I mentioned that Kane... They're able to beat them because Kane distracts the monsters with his sound paint? By the way, sound paint. I, I guess I haven't really described that. Sound paint, I guess, in this world is you spray something in the air. And then whatever sounds are in the air, it flickers into the colors and shapes that best resemble that sound. Actually, not a terrible concept. That's pretty cool. 
But, so, he has the sound paint on him. Lex points out how it's not regulation and he could get in trouble for having it on him. And she uses that to her advantage to, to beat the, the cannibals. Except, how does he have the sound paint? They're in a simulation. They should only have the things they were programmed to have. So how does he have sound paint? That just makes no fucking sense. I mean, it's just bullshit. Fuck. Oh, my. Overall, this whole simulation is just... It's riddled with plot holes. And the more you look at it, the less it makes sense. And that's not... That's not to say that that's the only issue this book, this, this chapter has. It has a lot of issues. Like 124, when I pointed out that they said it goes against everything we were taught. But it goes against everything we've been taught to value. Well, guess what? We want to know that because you haven't shown us any of Lex's training. So we don't know what they've been taught to value. And in fact, it goes directly against what you just said because it seems to say, no, what she did was right. Kill off the people that... No, pedally kill off your squad mates if they annoy you. There's another section here where I'm 90% sure they, they use the wrong words. My blaster stops firing and even spent, I can use it as a club. I crack a scab in the head, but another rips the dead blaster out of my hands. Kane hands his off in my gut. And I shield him and keep firing. So, question... In your gut. As in, in your gut. Or across your gut. Because your gut is this. Everything in here. So, unless he put his hand through your gut to hand you your blaster. And one of the things that is very notable is because we're never told that they're in a simulation and other characters act like they're in a simulation... And we're not even told what this mission is until two chapters later. We're watching this blindly. And because it's such a chaotic scene, all, we're basically just watching chaos unfold without any glimpse of understanding of what could possibly be in the midst of it. So, when I'm sitting here reading this chapter, I'm just confused because I'm like, what is going on? We're not even told the mission parameters. We don't know why they're there. So when Lex keeps saying, we have to finish the mission, what is your mission? Why are you jeopardizing, as far as we know at this point, your literal life to do this mission? The mission is just kill the leader. So it's kind of like, again, none. this chapter is just so terrible. Let's go ahead and go to chapter 11. So chapter 11 is mostly a smaller chapter where we see Lex's apprenticeship as a spec op soldier in the Rock Bottom Patrol. And this is mostly we just see her living arrangement. Then we're told to go sit in a corner and imagine all this awesome training she's going through as we're given a very basic, I was taught to do this, this, and this, and this. Anyways, and then we see her first mission and get to realize how fucking stupid the military of this country is. After that, we go to meet up, we go to a meetup spot for her and Kane. Lex thinks she got stood up only to find casinas waiting for her. So seriously, Indra's military is so stupid. It's so stupid. Namely speaking, Lex has graduated and been moved to a special operations center. So she gets a week to get, to do all this new training that she is in special operations. Yep. The military also violates its previously established community because it tries to do the men in black thing where it completely strips their cadets of their identity, giving them only the first letter of their name as their identity. So Lex is an operative Lex, she's operative L, and she's watching over operative O and operative C undergoing a mission. She's also not allowed to ask any questions or talk to them in any way, and nothing is explained to her. So she's with us in the corner just watching what's going on and being told to imagine what's going imagine learning. And then we see the actual op she's put on. 
but again, she's granted, but she's granted surveillance over this op to watch it happening, kind of serving almost as an overwatch. But then she's told she can't speak. If she's working as an overwatch for the two, then why can't she speak? She even ends up saving their lives because she violates that order and warns them of an encroaching scout craft that neither of them noticed that, but she did. But the the the, the, op, the rock bottom patrol is such hard asses that they still just yell at her for they still reprimand her for breaking the rules and speaking first and foremost among anything else. So the but if she was supposed to just watch the mission for experience, why the hell does she have any microphone privileges? Especially considering that they'd have to be far away. So it's not like she can just pick up her typical radio and tune in real quick. Hey guys, you got something coming? So they had to give her a line in which she can speak to them, but then order her to never speak. So she's either on Overwatch and them ordering her not to speak is stupid, or she's meant to just be watching to gain experience, and them giving her mic, mic access is stupid at all. But then we get to the Kane memory section. Buzz plot hole. Now, <laughs> plot holes. First plot hole. Kane tells her to meet him in two weeks at the end of the last chapter. Except when she finally goes to meet him, it's been almost three weeks later, and yet the book still treats this as if she's on time. And that's not me exaggerating. Well, listen, two weeks and I haven't been permitted to leave the academy. This training is so specialized, senior lieutenant tells me, that you'll do it here, where you're deemed adequately prepared. You'll be relocated to your new base of operations. They don't even tell me where that will be. So, she hadn't been permitted to leave the academy. But, later on, we're told, I have a home pod, just like my sleeper pod, only bigger. For the first time, food is brought to me, and, I have tr and I'll have choices. I'll have turkey rations, I tell the woman who takes my order. Sometimes I choose the beef. There are choices, but not that many. She just shoves the tray of turkey into my hand, then she wheels her meal cart away. It's pretty much my only normal interaction of the day. I don't... So, yeah, it, it's kind of one of those... So she's got has to have moved because now she has her own separate room. For a week, he explains how to use the new equipment and technology. I complete weapons training and grow to like using pacifiers and decoys, even though blasters are more efficient. When I can finally plug myself in and operate the transmission valves, he leaves. No goodbye. Nothing. He programmed me to follow my daily schedule. So it takes her three weeks to get to a place where she can leave, right? Otherwise, you would have said the first week Langhorn does this, but it doesn't. Like, maybe it's meant to say two weeks, but it's not. So, then there's the second plot hole, or honestly, these could just be the characters being really fucking stupid. I keep, I keep using the word fucking, but I honestly cannot stop because I hate this book this much. So, Le Lex wonders how they got the memories of people to experience in the archives. Now, later on, we're, we're really told what the archives are. The archives are basically a large collection of memories and intelligence gathered from people that people can experience by plugging a chip into their brain and going into these memories and these experiences that have been carefully curated. This has been something that's established very early on. In fact, very early on, we're told that they insert a chip into your brain so you can do this. And Lex is over here wondering... Hmm, I wonder how they get these memories for the archive. It's a mystery. And it's just like, they put a fucking chip in your brain. How the hell do you think they're getting your memories? Believe it or not, this is treated as a big reveal later on in the book. The book literally treats it, yeah, you know that trip they put in your brain? They're using that to monitor your memories. No fucking duh! Like, <laughs> I, I can't express to you how dumb it is because literally listen to this this is the same fucking paragraph i was taught that your experiences are fired away by the high council and a handful are made available to you how they get them i'm still not sure there are in these are incidents that are they deem important pivotal points in your growth and development good times bad times i hope they've captured it all you're issued a memory chip as soon as you're old enough for the experiences not to induce trauma and you're expected to learn from these highlights of your life. You literally answer your own fucking question! So anyways, the third plot hole. 
despite the fact that we're repeatedly told that the rock bottom patrol is the special operations of the military, it ke- keeps getting treated like a terrible assignment and a rock bottom assignment, you could say. Like, I- I'm not exaggerating here. We're literally told repeatedly that this is like the elite of the elite. She's, she's, she's literally supposed to be the equivalent of like an army ranger and yet everyone treats her like she's a cook. Like, I'm not exaggerating, though. It's it's literally backed up in this in this chapter. There hasn't been an Academy graduate placed in Rock Bottom Patrol for almost 10 years. It takes a couple of days before all the new training equipment arrives. My, place, my placement reflects well upon the instructors. I'm even permitted to dine with him if I choose. I don't. But still, I should feel honored. Rock Bottom Patrol is the elite. If I pass the apprenticeship, I will be a special operative. And yet, when Casino shows up, she's like, yeah, I'm part of the PCF. I'm basically an MP. That means I'm way better than you in every way. And it's like, she's literally a ranger. And, and like, Casino's, like, rubbing, like, repeatedly rubbing in the fact, yeah, I'm an MP. That means I get access to stuff you don't. And all these cool equipment that you don't get access to, even though you're supposed to be the elite of the elite. And it's like, then why is she the elite of the elite? Like, if you wanted to do something like the Stone Wardens from Dragon Age, that's different. Because the Stone Wardens are elite, but you you know for a fact that they're being sent down there to die. You don't live as a Stone Warden, but you are respected as a Stone Warden. So maybe that's what they're trying to do with this, but it, it doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. Fuck it. I'm going to go make myself another drink. Um, I'll get back to you guys next time. Uh, so keep keep in mind for the next part of this review because I'm definitely going to have to break this up. If you can't tell, look at that little that little, that little time card, that, that little time down there and just see how long I've spent angrily ranting about the first 11 chapters of this book. But in any case, I'm going to go make myself a new drink. We'll, we'll pick up again another day, guys. Hopefully, probably Wednesday.